We depend on your support here at the Zero Hour, so please give whatever you can at any of the links you see on your screen. Thanks so much. My next guest is a prominent voice on behalf of Palestine and Palestinian rights. He got to that cause through an interesting tra and important trajectory that I expect we'll talk about a bit. Miko Peled is the author of the book, The General's Son, which is a memoir, a political memoir. He is also the author of a book called Injustice, the story of the Holy Land Foundation Five, and the Holy Land Foundation story was uh, rather infamous during the height of uh, uh, the Bush administration, I think it was. Uh, and uh, I heard him speak recently, was very uh, moved by what he had to say. Uh, I invited him on, he very kindly joins us now. He's been making a lot of re uh, recent appearances uh, in media, so I'm glad he found the time for us. Miko Pellet, welcome to the program. Well, it's good to have you. And one of the reasons I wanted to speak with you is that, as I mentioned in the introduction, your trajectory is an interesting and important one, I think. Uh, even though it applies to your life in Israel, it seems to me now it, it's relevant to some of the debates going on here in the States as well, where I believe you live. Um, you grew up, uh, I've read your book, The General's Son, uh, your father was a leading figure in the Israeli military. As I understand it, you come from a prominent Israeli family. And even though your father was, I guess you could say, progressive in terms of calling for uh, negotiations after the 1967 war and so on, uh, you still, to come from where you were to where you are, uh, seems like quite a shift, and I'm sure you hear that a lot. Uh, again, thanks for having me. So, you know, it's interesting, the, the context, when we talk about Israel, um, suddenly a, uh, a retired general or, or a man who dedicated his life to, you know, the establishment of the state of Israel, to its wars, to its military, um, and then one day said, well, you know what, we should compromise just a little bit. That is considered progressive right. and uh and today even and, to, and and you know and it was madness then because even then after 1967 he, he became a pariah for for suggesting <clears throat> excuse me the two-state solution and of course today talking about it is even even more outrageous <clears throat> but that kind of shows you the how how far to the right the we've accepted um and we're willing to accept on the issue of uh, of uh of israel how far to the right we're still willing to call people progressive even though they're clearly uh, not progressive uh, but yes i came from this very prominent uh, zionist family my father was not the only prominent member of the of the zionist uh leadership and kind of the zionist uh you know founding fathers if you will i have a grandfather who signed the declaration of independence and was a leading Zionist who came to Palestine um, in the 20s. I have a great uncle who was a president. So, I mean, family dinners, family gatherings were all about the state. They were all about Zionism. They're all about how do we contribute to the state and how Zionism, how do we further the cause of Zionism? Um, nothing was ever said, of course, about uh, the people that the Zionists have trampled and destroyed. And then to come from that and gradually realize that this heroism, that this mythology, that this wonder that we are you know, taught to learn is, is the creation of Israel is actually a horrific war crime and, and um, a crime against humanity. That is a trajectory. It's also a very painful process. But once you've reached that, that you know, intersection, if you will, you have to make some difficult choices. And then, you know, if I think I made the, the, the choice that my conscience led me to, to make, which is to reject Zionism and, and support the cause for justice in Palestine. And one of the reasons why I bring it up, Miko, is because here in this country, uh, I come from a multi-ethnic, multi-religious religious background, but I was raised Jewish. I was bar mitzvahed. I was raised in a largely Jewish milieu during the time uh, when Zionism was the accepted norm for American Jews as well. Uh, perhaps not as uh, closely adhered to as in Israel itself, but very strong. I, I believe the first movie my parents ever took me to see in a movie theater 
was Exodus. Let me guess. Let me guess. Exodus. Yes, you got it. And as I look back on it now, um, I, uh, I, I, I can't get over the song that begins, this land is mine, God gave this land to me, which even for my good liberal parents, if any other person from any other religion had said such a thing, they would have branded him or her, rightly, I guess, as a fanatic. But this was the mainstream view, or a zealot at the least, but this was, and to a large extent, remains a mainstream view in American Judaism. So one of the reasons why I find your story so compelling is because um, even to stray from that uh, that or if political orthodoxy of uh, unquestioning support for Israel, it's easier clearly among younger uh, Jewish people. But I find that a lot of people I know, who are, many of whom I've been friends with for a long time, who are very enlightened on many subjects, uh, have a brick wall uh, when it comes to Israel. They can't see the inherent contradiction, for example, in opposing Christian nationalism and yet supporting Jewish nationalism, uh, nor can they fully see the Palestinians as human beings. And as I read your book, you know, I wondered, I got the impression, I don't think you stated explicitly, that the first step was seeing Palestinians not just intellectually, but emotionally in their full dimensionality as human beings. That was an important part of your step. And I wonder why it is that so many people find that, uh, so many uh, people who are sympathetic to Israel, whether Jewish or not, uh, find that so difficult to do. Well, once you cross that line, there's no turning back. That's why they don't want to do it. That's why you know, that's why growing up as an Israeli, and, and not only Israeli, I think as a Zionist in this country too, you know, there's this, you have to embed this uh, this uh, one-dimensional uh, description of Arabs, of Palestinians, of Muslims, so that, God forbid, you will not enter into that into that realm where you see people as people, where you dare to see the other as people, because once you do, there's no turning back. So that was exactly the process I went through. At some point, I met Palestinians, and, and, and I saw the full... And it, and when I saw that, it kind of it made sense because for some, you know, it made sense to me. I felt I felt very comfortable with that. Um, whereas to some people, when they do dare to take a little step into that other world, into that the life of the other, the sphere of the other, they run back to the safety of their own, you know, prejudice. But yes, that is exactly it. And 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 the people always ask me, you know, how do you overcome the fear? And is you know, how do you teach the fear? And how do you teach the hate? Well, that's precisely how to teach fear and hate. You make sure that you never ever into enter into that sphere where you see the full like you said dimensionality of the of the other as a human you see them as a person you see them as a husband a wife a mother a child a, a poet a writer a teacher and on and on and on as israelis you don't learn this as americans you don't learn this there is no well um, while well, americans just like israelis are educated with this very compelling story the Zionist story, the return of the Jews after the Holocaust and after 2,000 years and so on, there is no parallel. There's nobody teaching the Palestinian side. Nobody knows anything about Palestine. We're lucky if they don't confuse Palestine with Pakistan. You know, when you talk to Americans, educated people. And so that does not exist. So how possibly could, you know, so that, that that's why it makes it so easy for Americans to be Zionists. They've never heard the other story. They've never been exposed to the other story. And they haven't really ever been exposed to the real story of Zionism, the real story of Palestine, the richness of the history and the culture of Palestine as a country, and the, the catastrophic results of the Zionist project in Palestine. So both of these things are, are sorely, sorely missing from the discourse and from the education here in America, just like they are uh, in Israel. One of the things that all, uh, your book also brought to mind for me was you know, my own godfather, uh, was a wonderful man, uh, loving, kind, everybody loved him, a leading light at, at the synagogue and so on. And he he moved to Israel in the mid-1960s, made aliyah, as they say here in this country. And when he came back after a couple of years for a visit, 
Uh, he was still the same loving man, except when the subject of Arabs came up and suddenly they were animals. They were, you know, he was talking about them in a way that he had never, I had never seen him talk about other human beings before. And uh, as you say, you know, the culture in, uh, in Israel, if anything, has become harsher or more conservative than this would have been maybe early 1970s. Uh, so one of the things that uh, I hear often when I talk to people about, you know, finding a real solution for Israel, Palestine, we'll talk about that a little bit more in a minute, but is uh, you're dreaming to think, you, Richard, in this case, are dreaming to think that uh, Israelis and Palestinians can get along because uh, if they're mainstream, they'll say because the Palestinians just wake up every morning thinking about Jews, how many Jews they can kill today. If they're more liberally minded Zionists, they think because most Israelis won't live with them either. Those two people will never get along. And this to me is a relevant question because when I hear that, for example, one state solution isn't realistic, I look at a map of the West Bank, the occupied West Bank and the settlements there. And I think what really seems unrealistic is to think you could get those settlements out of there. But uh, before we even begin to talk about a solution, it seems to me that uh, we need to at least reflect on what it would take. I'm not worried about the Palestinians, frankly. I'm worried about uh, the Israelis and American Jews learning to get over whatever uh, blend of fear and hatred is driving them right now. Clearly, you did it. You know others who have done it. Uh, I don't, I'm not expecting a, a, a secret sauce, but uh, uh, what are your thoughts on that whole issue of over overcoming that uh, hatred? Well, we have, there's a history. I mean, this is not going to be the first time the two warring sides have ended up uh, living in the same political, you know, the same political structure in a single state. I mean, this happened so many times. South Africa is probably the most glaring example, but there's so many other countries you know, I mean, I remember where when Spain was torn apart by fascism, and and uh, and so was Portugal, and uh, you know, uh, Greece was was led by a military junta, as was most of Latin America, and these were issues. They they may not have been two nations, but these were issues that tore societies apart. People were were the societies were torn apart, and they had to be brought together to heal. And um, and 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 there's only really one way realistically to do it, and that is when the other side is defeated, when fascism is defeated, when 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 military juntas are defeated, when uh, when apartheid regimes are defeated, then the next morning the people who supported these uh, the the racism and the violence and the apartheid and the fascism and so fascism and so on. They have no choice. They have to get up in the morning, go to work, send their kids to school and live with this new reality. And they notice that the sky doesn't fall. That is the way to transformation. And then you have to really put in place a humane education system, a progressive uh, constitution. I mean, there are measures to make it work. We've seen it before. We don't have to invent the wheel. In fact, Israelis and Palestinians are very similar in many, many ways. In other words, I think the case the 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 um, the case or the argument for success of Israelis and Palestinians living under in a single state peacefully and and very in a very productive way is much stronger than most other cases that we've seen around the world because because of the particular situation there. But you know this is this is what happens. There's no way. I mean, whites in America and United States. I mean, you know, in the South and other parts of America, they have to live with the fact that. They now are equal to people of other colors. With other, the whites are have to live with this, and the best. There's no other way to do it. They have to be defeated. They have to be on their knees. They have to be at a place where they cannot function any longer. The supremacy is no longer an option. And then they realize that just because everybody can enjoy the same privileges, and of course in America we're far from that, in South America, South Africa we're far from that. Uh, but bec just because everybody enjoys the same privileges, it doesn't take away from you from you. Expanding the privilege to the other does not take away from you. It just enhances everybody's life and improves the life of everybody altogether. So I don't think I don't think this is there. There's any. It's it's not a magic sauce, but it is a reality that strikes so hard and so clearly that there's no other choice. And then everybody benefits. And that's the beauty of this: is that at the end of the day, 
when the fascists and the and the right wing or whoever they are and the military juntas and the apartheid regimes collapse, everybody is better off. Well, and and uh, you know, we, uh, as you say, we have examples for that. I was working in uh, the Soviet sphere, as they called it then, and in Eastern Europe and Central Europe when when the Soviet system fell, nobody saw that coming, frankly. It happened in historical terms very quickly in the space of two or three years. I was in South Africa very shortly after Mandela became president and then again. And uh, you know, people were feeling aware, their way through it and there were undercurrents of resentment on the, you know, that would bubble up particularly if you were in a public place and they didn't know you were American yet, they might make a comment or something. But it w was working, uh, not economically, of course, and, and that's another matter altogether. But uh, these changes are possible. It seems to me that uh, though when we talk about the process of change, when we say that fascism has to be defeated, that, you know, that statement contains two elements, right? It contain in this context. One is that we're, that when we talk about Zionism, we're talking about fascism. Two is that it can, in practical terms, be defeated. So first of all, uh, was I right? You were equating uh, the Israeli uh, system with fascism? Well, it certainly has elements of fascism. I would categorize it as apartheid. And then we have a report that was put out over two years ago by Amnesty International, uh, demonstrating with very good, very, very solid data that from the moment it was established, the, this uh, entity, the state of Israel, has been engaged in the crime of apartheid, which is a crime that is so heinous that is categorized as a crime against humanity. So it is apartheid, there's no question. I, I you know, when, when when I describe my upbringing, the state, the state, the state, the state, the, you know, how do we contribute to the state and the state and on and on and on, everything is about the state. That is equivalent to fascism. But I think that, I think that the, the category under which the, the Zionist project falls more accurately is, is apartheid without any, without question. It is an apartheid state. There's no absolute, you know, I mean, I remember seeing it as a child growing up in Jerusalem, not knowing the term for it, not understanding it fully. But as I look back now at the things I saw and experienced, there's no question that it was an apartheid regime. And apartheid can be defeated. There's no question. We've seen apartheid defeated in South Africa. We've seen legal apartheid defeated here in the United States uh, to, to a large degree, maybe not completely, but at least legally. Um, and there's no reason why apartheid in Palestine cannot be cannot be uh, defeated and replaced with a, with, a, with a system that affords equality and, and opportunity to everyone. And of course, when we talk about changing that system, I, I think there are two things we, uh, worth exploring, Miko. One is, uh, one is the elephant in the room, which is to say the United States. And the other, which maybe we'll start with, is the argument that if you're talking about, for example, a unified Palestine, let's say Palestine, the phrase Palestine shall be free from the river to the sea, uh, notwithstanding Likud's own uh, similar rhetoric about uh, about Israeli control, uh, you know, geographically the same from the river to the sea. But notwithstanding that, when you talk to people uh, in this country, what, what you often get, I would say what you typically get, is you're talking about the destruction of Israel, you're talking about uh, uh, genocide against the Jews, you're talking, you know, on and on and on. Right, but if right, right. If I float a phrase in return, and I'm not saying, you know, it's up to the Palestinians to determine their fate, not someone like me, but if I say, well, what if there were a country called, quote unquote, the democratic state of Israel and Palestine? Or, you know, what if we focus less on names, and more on a unitary state that operates along democratic principles where nobody's driven out, nobody's killed, uh, that's happening right now to Palestinians, you know, on massive scale. But uh, let's just say it doesn't happen to anybody, and the future is resolved democratically. Uh, it's as if they never thought of that, and it seems to me that links with the other issue of uh, the United States being the complete enabler here. If the United States were to shift its position and say, "Okay, uh, we should sanction and boycott 
a country that practices apartheid, as we did with South Africa. We should not support them militarily, et cetera, et cetera. We should not provide them diplomatic cover in the United Nations. It seems to me that the entire scenario would move quickly, but it seems that we, that seems almost as much a political possibility, impossibility as anything else we're talking about. What do you think? Well, if we sat here and it was 1988 and somebody suggested Mandela would be president of a free South Africa within five, six years, I think the, the people would have said the exact same thing. It's impractical. It's impossible. It's not realistic. America supports it uh, in every possible way and won't allow it. And, you know, it happened. So things happen in spite of what America may or may not want. But I think th th there's two issues here. One is there's a reason why the Zionists have been invested so heavily in influencing the American education system, American politics, American culture, American media. I mean, they've been working over 100 years. My grandfather was part of this, you know, diplomatic group, diplomatic corps, if you will, traveling around the world, you know, and 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 kind of making sure that the idea of Zionism is is, is planted very deeply in 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 Western in Western countries. And again, using all of these different uh, aspects of, of culture and, and education and media and so on. Um, but uh, and so, yeah, so if you come to Americans right now and you suggest boycotting Israel, you, you, it makes perfect sense that they would think you're anti-Semitic. <clears throat> Excuse me, but you have to add, add context. You have to add context to this. There's an apartheid report by Amnesty International. Never mind other human rights organizations have had different reports as well. <clears throat> but there's a report that explains precisely it's an apartheid state. So those of us that know and have known it's been apartheid state, you know, before the Amnesty came out with a report, fine, you can maybe ignore that. But there's no question that it's an apartheid state. Now, it's got nothing to do with Jews. It's got to do with boycotting apartheid. It's got to do with imposing sanctions against apartheid. The only, you know, nobody's talking about within this conversation, the only people who bring up killing Jews are the Zionists who don't want to see uh, a, a free, democratic Palestine with equal rights. So they say, yes, you're talking about genocide. Yes, you're talking about destruction. They're the only ones who are talking about it. And they are the only one who are actually executing the destruction from the moment the state of, from before, the, from you know the end of 1947, before the state of Israel was established. You know, my father was an officer in these terrorist, one of these terrorist groups that went through Palestine and burned villages and massacred people by the thousands. God knows even know how many were massacred. And deported close to a million, forcibly deported close to a million Palestinians out of their homes and their land in order to replace them and build something else with other people. So, I mean, there's a definition, there's, that, 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 there's a name for that process, it's genocide. You know, and there's a reason, I think, I think there's a reason now people talk about genocide, it's, it's, it's very late in the game. But there's no question that genocide was the purpose of the Zionists from the very beginning, and, and look at what they've done. Look at how much they've, destruction they've caused. Look how many thousands, countless, were murdered, not just on the last three or four months, but over the last 75 years. And so we're looking at, we're looking at somebody who says, well, if you, if, you, if you talk about dismantling this racist, genocidal regime, you're going to talk about the genocide of the Jews. Hold on. Who is committing genocide? Who has just murdered over 30,000 people in the Gaza Strip? Who has been massacring Palestinians for 75 years? Who's been actually doing this? All right. So <clears throat> that is part of the camp. That is how they can campaign for, you know, to justify what they're doing and to make sure that nobody dares to speak against or, or for replacing this regime with a real free democratic Palestine with equal rights, because God forbid, if that happens, the Zionist project is, is going to fall apart. So I think the context is really, really important. You know, calling for boycott and sanctions without the context doesn't make sense. You're not using the, uh, there's a reason why the apartheid report by Amnesty has been shelved and nobody's talking about it. You know, it should be, it should be adopted by every NGO. It should be adopted by every governmental agency, you know, and, and the other side have done that with this new definition of anti-Semitism, knowing full well that these days are coming, that the days that Israel will be accused of genocide and be accused of ethnic cleansing and be accused of, 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 of apartheid are upon them and they need to put out everything they've got in order to defend themselves. And that's what they're doing. So context is crucial, and I think we have the context, we have the law, but I say we, I mean people of conscience who want to see justice in Palestine. We have international law on our side, we've got history on our side, and we've got, you know, morality and, and the facts on the ground on our side. What's missing is actually taking this and running with it and using it in order to bring about this change, which, like I said earlier, at the end of the day will benefit everyone. And uh, which gets us to uh, the next topic I wanted to discuss rather smoothly, uh, which is 
activism. Uh, I, I know that you feel, as many of us feel, that as, while a ceasefire is imperative, I, you know, the mass murder of of innocent civilians, including children, is clearly something one wants to stop as quickly as possible. Uh, it's it's hardly a goal in itself. I, I, in other words, uh, it is the latest, perhaps the most extreme in recent memory, example of a long-standing uh, process of, of genocide, of an attempt to exterminate a, a nation, a people. Uh, but in terms of activism, it's important not only to call for ceasefire, but to call for uh, this reset that we're talking about, this reorientation toward uh, a truly democratic uh, state. And it, what are your thoughts? I know you've been organizing uh, a project yourself. And I don't know if it's reached the discussion point yet, but uh, what are your thoughts about how people uh, can get involved and stay involved in the issue of creating uh, justice in that part, in Israel slash Palestine? Well, there's several things, there's several layers. I mean, you know, Ramadan is, is upon us now and the holy month of Ramadan and, uh, you know, Muslims, you typically break the fast with dates and the market is, 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 is flooded with dates made in Israel, mostly grown in the West Bank. So uh, there's a campaign out there that's been out there for years um, and it's becoming harder and harder to find out where the dates are from. But I think it's imperative that people uh, who are practicing Muslims who, who fast during this month um, make sure that they, the dates they buy are not Israeli dates. In fact, make sure that they are dates made in other places because Israel now, not only do the dates often don't say made in Israel, they say all kinds of other things. So I think that's one example. You know, it's, 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 it's not, I mean, it's important. It's not huge, but it's important. Um, but on, in the greater scale, I think the calls for ceasefire are too small. I mean, can you imagine people uh, asking Hitler for a cease, to agree to a ceasefire? I mean, uh, it's absurd. Ask the perpetrator of a genocide. Ask them. Ask them. Beg them to agree to a ceasefire. And when they don't agree to a ceasefire, just let them get away with it. Not to mention, arm them. Not to mention arm them and continue supplying them more and more weapons, knowing full well these weapons are going to committing genocide. So I think the conversation when it comes to Palestine, but we, you know, we've gotten used to such a low standard. If it was any other nation, people would be would be jumping. What are you talking about? Uh, talking about ceasefire? There has to be an immediate embargo on arms. Uh, you know, arms sales to Israel. There has to be an immediate naval blockade. The Sixth Fleet is in the Mediterranean. There should be a blockade of Israel completely, and humanitarian aid must be given to Gaza immediately. The Sixth Fleet has that capability. That's you know, they're in the they're in the Mediterranean. Why is there no no-fly zone over Gaza? This, these are the demands that have to be met. Ceasefire, asking for ceasefire when there's a genocide going on is so small. This is what we become accustomed to when it comes to Palestine. Asking for very little and then, and then being so pleased and, and demanding the Palestinians be pleased with getting very little. You know, the life of any Palestinian today, I just interviewed a friend of mine who, who, who got out of prison, who was in prison now for three months. And he's been in prison many, many times. He's, he's, he's been an activist for 40 years. He's been in prison many times. The sexual abuse, the humiliation, the torture. The Palestinian prisoners are not permitted to walk on, on, on their feet. They have to walk on arms and on their hands and knees when they're in the prison. The abuse, the beatings, the dogs are unbelievable. And Israel is getting away with it. Now, the reality for Palestinian prisoners has been horrifying from the very beginning. But over the last three months... And Israel is getting away with it. Of course, everybody's paying attention to Gaza and they're not paying attention to anything else. The life of Palestinians is a life under terror, regardless of where they live. If they live, <clears throat> excuse me, in Yaffa or Lid or Haifa, which are you know considered, these are Palestinians who are considered citizens of Israel, or whether they're living in Jerusalem, they can't, as Palestinians are not permitted to enter the old city of Jerusalem. I mean, the, the, there is the, the life of Palestinians is a life under terror, under terror. It always has been, but of course, since October 7th, it has been elevated to levels that are un, 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 unheard of, and nobody's paying attention to that either. So we're not talking about a limited space, a limited occurrence, which is limited only to the Gaza Strip. We're talking about hundreds being killed, thousands being arrested, 
and on and on and on and the light and the daily life being 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 just a lot like i said a life of terror so all of this has to be taken into account and then we have to make it clear that we're not calling for anything you know even people saying a lasting ceasefire a long ceasefire no no there has to be sanctions immediately placed an embargo on arms on arms sales and the life and security of palestinians have to be guaranteed there has to be a guarantee in place for the life and safety of Palestinians. That has never been part of the conversation, even though Palestinians have always, you know, had to had to suffer the, you know, the, the, the violence from Israel. So that has to be the conversation. And an end, an absolute end to the apartheid, an absolute end to the Zionist control of Palestine and to this abuse of the lives of Palestinians. A permanent political solution that brings it to a stop from this moment on. And that, nothing less than that, I think is appropriate when we're talking about, about what is happening in Palestine now. Do you have any specific recommendations before I let you go in terms of, uh, you know, contacting people, uh, supporting specific organizations or what have you? I mean, you know, I, you know, there, there are local organizations in every state, in every city, in every county, people can control, can, can contact me. We started an initiative here in Washington, D.C. We're calling it Dara Furia, which means House of, House of Freedom. We're gonna be start, we're start an actual place, an actual center here in Washington. Um, there are plenty of good organizations out there, but I think the important thing is that our elected officials, whether they're running for school board or running for president, have to understand that zero tolerance for uh, racism means zero tolerance for Zionism, that you cannot support Israel and, 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 um, and, and claim that you oppose racism. And our elected officials have to hear from us. And our journalists have to hear from us, the people who have the talk show host to interview Netanyahu and give him platform to spew his, his racism and his lies. You know, every single person can can do this. And again, there's plenty, you know, look at Palestine organizations uh, out there, um, you know, doing the work. There's lots of them all over the place, although they're quite scattered. Um, and there are protests in every city and every town, you know, participate in that and make sure that the, that the, that the poster you're holding doesn't settle for ceasefire, that it goes far beyond that. We have to work as a people, as people of conscience, to end this, to end the suffering and create a better future for Palestinians and for anyone who lives in historic Palestine. Well, Miko Peled, uh, activist and author, thanks for your great work and uh, thanks for coming on the program. Absolutely, thank you.